Hello. In this video, we will be sharing with you a structured, reasonable approach to the determination of brain death in adults. Our focus here is as a clinical resource to help focus in for clinicians who may need a brief reminder of some of the steps to be taken during this time. Again, as you can see here from the slide, our focus is primarily from the recent guidelines for determination of brain death from the New York State Department of Health and the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law from November of 2011. As you can see here, the first steps are to make sure that there is a coma present that is irreversible and the cause is known. And some of these issues are somewhat complex and would be beyond the scope of this instructional video, but nevertheless, to the extent that it's possible, it's very important that the etiology of the coma is carefully documented. Along those same lines, you will see here that it states that the appropriate waiting period has been followed with a blank for you to write in the time. And clinician judgment really is to be used here. There is no longer a focus on two neurological examinations, but rather an appropriate clinical uh, waiting period has occurred and has been documented. As is stated here, if there's concerns for hypothermia that has been induced clinically, perhaps a longer period should be performed in terms of waiting. As you can see here, neuroimaging should be performed. And as I will go into more detail in the next slide, CNS depressant drug effect should be absent. That there should be no residual paralytics on board that there should be an absence of severe acid base or electrolyte or endocrine abnormalities, that normothermia should be obtained as well as a normal blood pressure, and that as part of a screening approach, no spontaneous respirations are noted, and that at this point, reasonable efforts have been made to notify the patient's surrogate decision maker of the intention to initiate the determination of brain death. I'm reiterating here that a normal core temperature and normal systolic blood pressure should be obtained, if at all possible. I wanted to take a couple of moments and share with you the specific wording from the document on intoxicants if they're present, specifically the first couple of sentences. If intoxicants, such as barbiturates, benzodiazepines, or opioids are present, levels need not be zero, but should be in a range that would not normally be expected to interfere significantly with consciousness. Since it is impossible to stipulate specific levels for every drug, experienced clinical judgment is necessary. If levels are unknown, a reasonable practice is to wait five half-lives, or in the case of alcohol usage, the legal limit for driving may serve as a practical threshold below which an examination to determine brain death could reasonably proceed. A cerebral blood flow study that demonstrates absent intracranial blood flow is consistent with the diagnosis of brain death, even in the presence of CNS depressants. So let's move on to the neurological examination, again, in a structured approach, that the pupils are non-reactive to bright light, that the corneal, absence, the corneal reflex is absent, that the oculocephalic reflex is absent, again, and as I focus in on here when I'm working with trainees, the idea is you carefully hold on to the endotracheal tube, and as you move the head back and forth, the eyes should be moving with the head. That the oculovestibular reflex is absent, again, carefully looking in the ears prior to installation of cold saline, iced saline, and again, you're looking for the lack of movement of the eyes. Again, as is stated clearly here, no facial movement to noxious stimuli at the supraorbital nerve or the temporal mandibular joint. That the gag reflex and cough reflex are both absent, and importantly, that there is an absence of motor response to noxious stimuli and all, in all four limbs, although spinally mediated reflexes are permissible. And again, clinical judgment is required. We then move on to the apnea test, and my focus here for clinicians is to remember that the concept is that you are taking a patient, that you are hyper-oxygenating them, that you are trying to make them eucapnic, 
You then take nasal cannula, cut it, tie a knot in one side, put it at approximately six liters of oxygen, drop that down the endotracheal tube, and then at that point, you're watching carefully for approximately eight to 10 minutes You've documented a baseline arterial blood gas and documented an arterial blood gas after eight to 10 minutes to document hypercapnia. And the concept is in the setting of that hypercapnia, you're trying to determine if there are no respiratory efforts. And so again, here, according to the guidelines, you're looking at a core temperature, you're documenting systolic blood pressure, as I mentioned before, you're trying to make the patient have normal carbia or eucapnia normal PCO2. There are complex issues regarding the patients who may walk around with an elevated PCO2 with chronic hypercapnia, and that really is beyond the scope of this particular video to focus in on the routine patient where this situation has to be performed. That the patient is pre-oxygenated with an FiO2 of 100% on the ventilator for, as you can see here, greater than or equal to 10 minutes to get the PO2 greater than 200 millimeters of mercury that a baseline arterial blood gas is performed, and as I mentioned before, placing a nasal cannula down the endotracheal tube, the patient should already have a pulse oximeter attached, and then the patient is disconnected from the ventilator and observed carefully, usually in my experience by the group, for eight to 10 minutes. And then you check another arterial blood gas at the end of that time and reconnect the patient to the ventilator. As you can see here, an apnea test confirms brain death if respiratory movements are absent and the PCO2 is greater than or equal to 60 millimeters of mercury, or the PCO2 increases by greater than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury over baseline in the setting of patients who may have chronic hypercapnia. In those settings, the apnea test supports the diagnosis of brain death. The two issues where uh, the two issues where it's indeterminate would be if either the PCO2 does not rise or the patient is unable to tolerate the apnea test due to either hypoxemia or hemodynamic instability. If respiratory efforts are observed, the apnea test does not support the diagnosis of brain death. And again, the focus on this slide on ancillary testing is only if the patient requires ancillary testing, and as you can see here, to be ordered only if clinical neurological examination cannot be fully performed due to patient factors, or if the apnea testing is inconclusive, aborted, or not performed due to patient factors. And I've listed here, again, according to the guidelines, cerebral angiogram, nuclear brain scan, cerebral scintigraphy, EEG, or transcranial Dopplers, and in each hospital, there will more than likely be a preferred test for this clinical situation. Cerebral angiogram and cerebral scintigraphy appear to be the two that are the most straightforward in this particular situation. I put this in because I think it's a very nice summary of what's to be expected in terms of documentation, that the etiology and irreversibility of the coma should be documented, that the absence of cerebral responsiveness should be documented, that the absence of brainstem reflexes should be documented, that a careful documentation of the apnea test should be performed, and that if an ancillary test is performed, why it was performed, what the results were. This is the conclusion of our educational video, and I'd like to conclude with the important phone numbers that you can see on the screen here, 1-800-443-8469 to get in touch with Live On New York. Thank you very much.